hello, hello, hello. Okay, hello. Okay, we're start now. Hi. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Welcome back to this program about comedy. And I'm so happy that you are still all here, even though it's 30 degrees outside and a beautiful summer day. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this program. I'm Sophie Rutefrans. I'm a program editor here in the Bali. And <laughs> And together with Mariam Namazi, we made this beautiful weekend, uh, which I am very much enjoying. Um, I would love to introduce you to my colleague, Shirin Seda. She's going to be the moderator for today. Please give her a warm welcome. Welcome to the Bali and this conversation about criticism, human art. Uh, my name is Sharon Seda, I'm a program editor here at the Bali and your moderator for this program. Uh, we have an utmost interesting program ahead, uh, but first a few announcements. Um, there will be room for questions uh, from the audience at the end of the program. And uh, please keep in mind that the trick with questions is that they end with a question mark. So if it becomes a statement or a story, I will be the editor. And please speak into the mic. <laughs> um, we have three very great uh, speakers uh, today, and I'm very honored uh, that they can be uh, here with us today. Uh, let me say a few words about our speakers. Uh, Ali Rizvi is a Pakistani-born Canadian ex-Muslim writer and podcaster who explores the challenges of Muslims who leave their faith. Rizvi is the author of The Atheist Muslim, A Journey from Religion to Reason, published in 2016. It is a combination of personal biography and analysis uh, of arguments in favor of rejecting Islam. Armin Navabi is a former Muslim and the founder of the Atheist Republic, a nonprofit organization with over one million fans and followers worldwide. Armin started as a dedicated Muslim and even attempted suicide when he was 12 because this would get him into heaven. But after searching for God for many years, Armin's journey led him to leave Islam and to become an atheist. Armin is the author of the best-selling book, Why There Is No God, Simple Responses to 20 Common Arguments for the Existence of God. But before we will join in conversation with them, our third guest uh, speaker will um, receive the floor, Shabana Rahman. She's a Pakistani-born Norwegian stand-up comedian, writer, and columnist. She's known for her mullah lifting. She received enormous publicity after lifting mullah Krika. Her own reason for doing this stunt was, a person that can be lifted is not that dangerous. She also flashed her naked bottom saying, I want to show that in Norway you can do such things without being lynched or arrested. So we, before we welcome uh, Shabana on stage, uh, we are starting with a short film of hers. Mulla Kreka vill anmälde Shabana Rehman efter att hon lyfte han upp under en debatt i går. Ska testa if you are dangerous for Norwegians or not. Nej, det är inte bra. A woman shouldn't lift a man. But a man who is supporting Sharia, which is really insulting females, it's okay. Om jag ska visa dere det som vill ni är kontroversiellt bland pakistaner idag, så se på detta. Tulehullene forteller om det som skjedde på Grynelukka i Oslo i natt. Utestedet eies av Harana Rehman. Hun er storesøsteren til komikeren Shabana Rehman. Det er avfyrt mellom 10 og 20 skudd ifølge etterforskerne. Skytingen mot restauranten kan ha sammenheng med lillesøsterens opptreden. Stand-up-komikeren og skribenten Shabana Rehman fikk prisen for modig, kraftfull og nyskapende bruk av det frie ord for å bygge bro mellom kulturer. some little things to explain. <laughs> I understand that. But first of all, thank you, Mariam. Where is Mariam? Mariam, thanks so much again for this fantastic, warmth and including festival. I'm so glad that I've uh, been possible to join this for the second time. So thank you. 
So I started to do stand-up comedy for like 20 years ago in Oslo. And when I started, there were no comedians with my background. I was surrounded by white, male, Norwegian comedians, the Vikings. <laughs> they were my role models, okay? <laughs> That's why everything went wrong. <laughs> so they were my role models. I didn't thought that I need a colored role model or a Muslim role model. My role models was what is working on the Norwegian comedy stage, how to make people laugh. So I looked around and the comedians were making fun, you know, the jokes that their material was about how to get late, how to get drunk and immigrants. So I did the same. <laughs> so while people were laughing at the male comedian's jokes, I was receiving some different reactions. <laughs> and that will be my message throughout my career. It's not my action, it's your reaction. What is the problem? Let's debate that. Because the first thing I met was the Norwegian press keep asking me, oh, you are so outspoken. You're so controversial. They never said that to my colleagues. Later, I learned why. <laughs> but that was later. I didn't start it as an activist. I started because the love of comedy, the love of, you know, have the direct Contact with the audience, with no censor, you know? To meet people, to laugh together, no matter where you come from. So when I travel around people, you know, I'm from Pakistan, my parents are from Pakistan. But when I travel around, people always ask me, you must be Indian! <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Indians, we are different people, okay? Indians, they don't eat cow. <laughs> Indians eat pork. Pakistanis, we don't eat pork. Pakistanis eat Indians. <laughs> well, I, I don't eat pork, not because I'm Muslim. I don't eat pork because I'm vegetarian. My heart also, <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. My heart also belongs to animal rights, not only human rights. So... Thank you. So, you know, one time I was really badly verbally attacked by a group of Pakistani males who have this idea that, you know, women with Pakistani background shouldn't do comedy, shouldn't speak their truth like I did. So it really became a large debate about how these people were treating me in Norwegian press, because then I was a well-known name. So the, uh, the public keep asking, why does Pakistani males in Norway treating uh, Shabana like this so badly? You know, you are a whore. You're a Norwegian whore, you became Norwegian, everything is wrong with you because of that. Then, a very religious person in a political party, he decided that he will calm this issue down. So he said to me, Shabana, you know the Prophet Muhammad? He, one day, he saw a prostitute giving water to cats. And that action he found so noble that he forgave the prostitute. So Shabana, we have seen that your heart belongs to animals, therefore we forgive you. So now I'm feeding cats all the time and making blasphemy jokes all the time. <laughs> and I'm forgiven. <laughs> uh, 
before we go to the panel, I have to make a short explanation of the mooning. <laughs> Why the hell did I show my butt? It wasn't only because I want to show that in Norway you can get away with this. Bubba! Well, something happened right before, which was a provocation. For the first time in Norwegian film history, Norwegian and Pakistani came together and decided to make a movie, a love story. A love story. The film was the opening movie for Norway's largest film festival. It's like the Norwegian Oscar. And they invited me to open the festival and to, you know, greet the movie. And I have to see the, watch the movie before. And the script and the movie was like this. To get the Norwegian boy fall in love with a Pakistani girl, to get the love of his life, he had to convert to her religion, he had to get circumcised, and he had to sign the contract that if he ever dared to divorce the girl, the girl's father had the right to kill him. Wow. That was the script, and he converted, he got circumcised, and he signed the contract. And that was the happy ending, because they get, <laughs> they get married. They get married. And the girl, she had no lines. <laughs> because we fixed it, right? We fixed the cultural conflicts. We can live together. We just have to accept each other. And that was meant to be a comedy. I didn't want to say a bad word about that movie because, you know, there were like 1,000 people in the audience. There were big stars from Pakistan. The father played from a superstar from Pakistan, was between the audience. The cultural minister were there. And 1,000 directors from all over Europe was in the next room. So everything was on the full screen in the second room as well. So I went up the stage and I said that, no, Pakistani ladies, they don't shut up. In real life, we have lines. We write our own lines. <laughs> we do. So we have been living together in Norway for more than 30 years. Why is it so controversial that a Pakistani girl are marrying? or living with a Norwegian boy. That's not so controversial, but what might still is controversial is this, and then I did that. <laughs> I didn't thought that would be dangerous because, you know, really Scandinavian movies, they moon all the time. It's so common, so I didn't thought that my brown, political, feminist ass <laughs> will actually lead to bullet holes? That was scary. And then I learned why it's important to speak your truth, to keep your comedy, to find new ways. These challenges are challenging us. I want to show you another stunt I did. There was a literature, a literature festival it was about dangerous, dangerous books. And no one was speaking about what some here will call the world's name, the world's most dangerous books, Quran. No one was speaking about that, except the extreme right wings. So they start yelling, we should burn the Quran, burn the Quran. How would a satire, uh, a people, a comedian, you know, deal with this? The stunt I'm showing you now, it's how I dealt with this, to say what you want to say without getting your head cut off.
Kjære publikum, helt til slutt så vil jeg gjerne komme med en appell. Det burde være flere bokbål i dette landet. Dette er Koranen. Den boka har kanskje mer makt enn noen annen bok i vår tid. Hvis jeg brenner den, Da vil den kanskje få enda mer makt. Det burde være flere bokbål i dette landet. Det burde det. Ikke vær redd for at boka di blir brent. Vær heller redd for at den ikke blir brent. Tusen takk for meg. Nyt festivalen! This was, uh, I tried to not give the right wings what they wanted, but still, I wanted to touch the subject. And there were fanatics who get really crazy, really angry. Ah, oh, you didn't burn the Quran. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And another warm applause for our three speakers now, who will join uh, the panel discussion. <laughs> yes, they will be turned on. <laughs> Um, a very well, warm welcome to you, uh, Shobana, uh, Armin, and Ali. Um, and again, a welcome to this conversation about mocking religion, the role and function of comedy and ridicule, and the accusations of Islamophobia. Um, so the first question would be, why did you lift the mullah, and what were the reactions like? Because I think you did not elaborate on that. <laughs> The mullah lifting, <laughs> okay, I could have tattooed that on my forehead actually because uh, it has been many years ago I actually lifted him but I still, I mean, question that question but I think it will go over if more people start actually lifting mullahs. <laughs> then they will give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, what happened, Shirin, is that um, I was actually on my way to a nightclub. And mark my words, I was on my way to a nightclub where people do stand-up comedy and, you know, hook up and stuff like this. So then I saw this poster outside that nightclub <laughs> that Mullah Krekar is going to be there and present his new book. And this man was living as a refugee in Norway and was accused of, you know, organi organizing <laughs> of, uh, terrorism. And I wonder, wow, a mullah in a nightclub? You know, he has thrown his weapons, he's writing books, you know, that's good. We should go and, you know, applaud. And when I came into that room, it was packed. There was this feeling of fear in the room. The mullah was really charismatic. He was on the stage smiling and introducing his book and saying that I'm not a dangerous man. Norwegians should trust me. But this is Sharia. This is what I believe in. But I'm not a threat. And people were like sitting, you know, 
drinking their beers and looking really mad at him, and the atmosphere was really, ooh. And that was when I lift, you know, lifted my hand and said, I can help you. If I start to believe that you're not a dangerous man, let me help you, because these people don't believe you. And he, he let me on stage, and he ke it was like this, and he come to me. It wasn't like that I attacked the stage and I want to <laughs> lift that mullah. It wasn't like, <laughs> like that at all. He came to me, and I have to show. Do, do, can I show <laughs> the lifting technique? <laughs> fine until but, he, but he went up in the air and then his face changed and the audience like you did start applauding start laughing the whole energy in the room totally changed and then he get afraid <laughs> really and angry and I felt that the whole you know energy just I do my yoga, I do my meditation, I can feel that <laughs> the whole aura of him was changed. So I put him gently down again. <laughs> and then he yelled at, a woman should not lift a man! <laughs> and then he, accu he went to the police station and accused me for sexual harassment. W was he taken seriously? Fun fact that the the person who actually received the police, uh, 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 you know, from report from yeah. him, she was Norway's first, first Norwegian Arabic policewoman. <laughs> <laughs> and she dismissed the case. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea, the idea came spontaneously to you. you. You sat there and you thought, you know what I'm gonna do? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't planned to lift the mullah. The thing is, I've always been lift, I'm a lift-up comedian, more than a stand-up comedian. I lift people. Yeah. And I don't discriminate when I lift people. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the thing is that... The, I see. The, that stunt went world around, but I have lift like 250 men, yes. Sure. You mentioned that he didn't know he was going to be lifted before you lifted him. Yes. Um, just out of curiosity, what would you feel if there was a woman standing there and a man came on stage and without asking, just lifted up a woman? Well, I wouldn't have liked it. And I keep telling people because I couldn't go in public after the mullah lifting because everyone wanted to lift me. I have to stop <laughs> going out. But the thing is that like I said, you, you can't just, you know, what is your intention? I really didn't mean to harm him, and he was playing himself on that stage, and he was, you know, with uh, me all the time until the energy in the room changed, and, you know, the thing he actually said he wanted, that people weren't, uh, he, he lost his authority, right? So I'm not defending that all the time. Maybe, you know, he has been, in a very much troubled situation in Norway as well. But the reaction here was interesting because peop the, the left wings tell told me that you shouldn't have lifted the mullah, you should have respected the Muslim minority's culture. You have been too Norwegian. And the right wings said that after lifting the mullah, you should have thrown them out of the country. <laughs> and you know, this different reaction keeps starting the debate. And I'm open to discuss if I shouldn't have done it, but it happened there and then. And I don't recommend people to, to lift pe people without asking. Just ask. Ali, what, what do you think about these uh, reactions she just um, uh, talked about? 
I was thinking of there's there's a story I like to tell that happened on Twitter, which is a for those who don't know, it's a presidential forum where people <laughs> um, draft foreign policy. Anyway, uh, and I was having this argument uh, with it wasn't really an argument. Someone was talking about uh, someone had criticized something, said something about Islam, and then the, the, this other guy had come up and said, "You can't do that. That's racist. You're being racist." Um, and then the first guy came back and he said, "But." Islam is not a race, right? It's a religion, it's not a race. So I thought I'd have fun, I jumped in, I said, you know, but Islam is a race, because first you hear a loud bang and then everyone starts running. <laughs> and <laughs> the backlash, it, so it became a huge, like, oh, you're making fun of suicide bombing victims, you're doing this, you're doing, and I thought, I was like, why can't, I, you can make these jokes about uh, Christianity, Jewish stand-up comedians, I mean, do I, I don't even need to say anything else. But, but you can do this about everything else, why can't you joke about it? And I think um, what you did by lifting the mullah perfectly illustrates it. That the reason comedy and satire and mockery is so important is because it targets the people who want to be taken really seriously. Okay, and I'll give you some examples. Kim Jong-un, leader of North Korea, when he, people are writing op-eds about him, serious things in the New York Times, he feels legitimized, like, yes, I'm a player on the world stage. But when Seth Rogen made a movie called The Interview that just completely mocked him and showed him getting uh, killed in a very funny way, um, he lost his shit. Like, the guy, he got hackers to shut down, like, the movie theaters pulled out, he called it terrorism, it became a huge deal. That got to him way more than all of the other criticism. A jihadist, you can write all the op-eds and all of the, uh, you can do all the commentary, serious commentary about terrorism and Islamic terrorism you want, but when you draw a cartoon, that drives them insane. Um, it's, uh, Donald Trump, you know, he's like, you can, he feels legitimized when people criticize him and people taking him seriously and they're writing serious articles about him, but if you <laughs> make fun of the size of his hands, he feels compelled to go on national TV in a debate and talk about how big his penis is. He did this. <laughs> For those who don't know this, he actually did this. So um, it's powerful because these people want to be taken seriously more than anything else and to, to deprive them of that but and show that, no, you, you uh, it's, it's important sometimes to tell people who have ridiculous ideas that we can ridicule them. But for that, for that to work, the, we have to draw a line, and the line is not getting physical, even in the mildest way possible. I and agree that, with that, I know where you're going. Just yeah, no, like, because <laughs> <laughs> recently on Twitter you were saying that, you know, throwing milkshake at conservatives is, like, funny. And I thought, I disagree with you on that. And then after that you said, well, it's wrong, but it's still funny. No, I said it from the beginning. <laughs> okay. I said, uh, do you want to finish? Or yeah, no, I? no, I was basically, well, I'm glad that you said, you know, ask permission because that, that would make it all okay. But a lot of people, when it comes to expressing uh, yourself and speech and art and everything, I think there should be no limit other than inciting violence and scams, right? And for, for us to emphasize that that limit should not exist is for us to stay on the side of expression and never cross that line never cross the line where we get physical and invade other people's personal space. So for you, the line is a physical line. So if it gets physical, there's the line for you. Well, no, I mean, physical without permission, right? I, I mean, art is physical, so that's a, that's a form of expression. Mullah lifting? Well, I mean, she, she, she um, mentioned, she said ask for permission, so she agrees with me. And also, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the great thing about c comedians is that they are always in the front line and making sure the expression the limits of expressions do not ex exist. Like every time there's a line introduced, they are at the front lines pushing that, that limit. But what we need to be careful is a lot of people are like, oh, comedians are allowed to do that, but not mm. everyone else. That's Normal not, people. No, not. but that's not, that's, not, that's not right. Comedians do not have a license that the rest of us don't. Comedians are there to push that line. So when, when people laugh at a joke that they were nervous about laughing before, now, 
they're giving us the rest of us permission to say the same things. Maybe less funny. But anyway, I don't know why I'm on this panel. I'm the le least funny person in this entire room. No, Armin, you're funny. You're hilarious. You make. Me <laughs> can, can I respond yeah, to you, the? Yeah, you can respond, and then I would just, like uh, to hear Shabana's opinion. The characterization. Well, oh, yeah. oh. No, I just have a note. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please that? go ahead. Go you ahead. know, yes, I said that that you shouldn't. You know you should ask first, but it's like common people should ask, you know, there is a personal place, but this mullah, he didn't ask anyone when he starts shooting people, when he hanged people because they are homophobic or stoned people to death because he was accused of a really serious thing and he was on a stage and he was playing with the audience. So, so you know, th this was a, like a staged thing and even then you should, I, I mean, it, it, it should be a line, because uh, the, the line is violence. The li li line is you shouldn't, you know, uh, you know, kick uh, down or whatever. But this is, was really, it, that's why I'm pointing out that I, I didn't jump on stage. I asked permission, but he didn't know what I was going to mm. do. And the whole thing was friendly, but because the authority, you know, fell down, right. he really clicked. So. Yes, you should push the li limits, but this was staged, but you know, if you do push the limits and you are not a comedian or even a comedian on, um, uh, you know, common people, you will get beaten up, <laughs> you right. know? Can I but just, no, I just ask, um, to sorry, I'm the editor. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up uh, question on your uh, statement just now? Yeah. Um, it's kind of um, related to the question if um, you think that comedy should be about punching up and not punching down. And that, again, is connected to uh, the question of power. Um, so is the aim to question and ridicule power? And who has that power? And um, do people who get offended have the power? Or, yeah, what is that's, your thought on that? That's a really good question, and it ties in with what I was going to respond with the milkshake Sorry, thing. Sorry, Armin. So, no, it's, uh, and I, uh, we're talking seriously about milkshakes, so I'm just going to go ahead and indulge. But my whole thing was that, you know, we were, Armin was talking about when people were throwing milkshakes on people. So this is an example of um, people with generally less power throwing milkshakes on uh, people with more power to humiliate them. Now, and I've, I've said this in the beginning, I think it's wrong. I think there should be legal consequences. I think that if you do that, then you should pay a price. I wouldn't do it personally. But if I see a picture of Nigel Farage covered in gorilla bukkake, it's fucking hilarious. I think it's funny. I reserve the right to laugh. Now, if you have, for instance, you know, if you have a bunch of incels, you know incels? The, yeah, yeah, and they are throwing a milkshake on an Afghan woman refugee, then no, that would not be funny. Um, but if you had a bunch of incels and this Afghan woman refugee came and threw a milkshake on them, it would be wrong. There should be legal consequences. It should technically be considered assault, but it's hilarious. Like, I, I reserve the right to laugh and I think that um, the question I think is: yeah. Is it punching down mm. if you um, if you mock a minority religion? Is because or it, is is it not punching down because you, it, you it is, uh, so made a point that it might be not the case? Punching down when it comes to, for example, criticism of Islam. That's let's look at that. In a lot of uh, Western countries, Muslims are a minority. Or there's a legitimate bigotry against them. You know, we see that, you talked about the extreme right, you know, they, they do it all the time. Um, so, over there, it can be seen as punching down. But when you go to the places where I grew up, like in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, where Armin grew up in Tehran, then uh, it, Islamic theocracy is the lay of the land. That's, that's what it is. In that case, it's very different. This is why you see people burning their hijabs in Iran, whereas in the US, white women are wearing hijabs to show solidarity with people in the Women's March. It's, it's a really bizarre phenomenon. It's hard to understand sometimes for the average person who's looking at it, but this power structure thing can, it can vary tremendously depending on where you are geographically. S culturally. Even, so even if it's, a, it's a, if it's a minority religion in the country, you say that it kind of translates, the power structures translate into 
I still think that if there are bad ideas, you should be able to satirize them and you should be able to talk about them. I don't care, wh like whatever the minority is, even if it's a minority, there are, you know, Mormon Scientologists, they're minorities, they have some really ridiculous practices and beliefs and we mock them all the time. We should do the same thing with uh, Muslim minority groups. You know, people who, if there are bad ideas, they should be criticized and criticizing means satire, it includes mockery and that includes for minorities. Yeah. So I, I did burn the Quran um, and I put it on YouTube and I, the way I made sure that it wasn't being used to hate on Muslims is by explaining before I burn it, I burned a copy of my own book, uh, like if this is hating Muslim then I also hate myself. Um, but And the reason I, ke I keep trying to push the limits is to show that there shouldn't be any limits. But for that to work is we don't cross the line, that we just keep it at expression. And I, and I think it doesn't matter how bad the other side is, if, even if it's the devil himself, even if it's somebody that, Thanos, okay, half the world dead. Um, it, the reason why I don't want to cross that line is because what you both mentioned, they, they are, the, the, the strongest weapon against, that we have against them is speech and expression. And for that to be powerful, we have to, show that that's, there's no limit to that. And once we cross that line, now they have power over us. Because now we have crossed, this, the, the only thing that we could consider sacred, the uh, closest thing to sacred for us is that line. We cro when we cross that line, then we don't have a point anymore that we can express anything we want and there shouldn't be any limits. That's, that's the only thing. You know, so it doesn't matter if they co murdered half of the world or anything. W with regards to the milkshake, and you're saying, well, yeah, it's still funny and I have the, right to say it. No, nobody's questioning your right to say it. Um, but the thing is, I think it's missing the point. I think the fact that it's funny, I think Sarah Hader just last in the way that she mentioned it, I think was better because with the way you say it's funny is, is kind of normalizing it or it seems like you're saying it's okay even though you clarified that it's not okay. But the way she explained that it's funny is that it's actually more dangerous if it's funny because you're normalizing that kind of behavior. It's easier. If you throw milkshakes at a minority woman, that's not, no, nobody, most people are not gonna find that funny and you're not normalizing that behavior. In fact, most people that look at it are gonna demonize that kind of behavior, and rightfully so. But if it's funny, that's more dangerous because now you're normalizing something that shouldn't be normalized. But it's also true, I mean, it's, it's part of uh, emotional, uh, like the thing is we can say that okay, we don't want it to be funny, we can say that we don't, but the way that people react to things, and I, I gave you, there's this other example of, of a man who went out into uh, this, uh, I think it was a crowd, he was out in public and he had a sign around his neck that said, you deserve to be raped, right? And uh, I remember seeing this, 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 well, I didn't see it in person, I, I read about it, this woman uh, came and she hit him on the head with a baseball bat and I, you know, and people were saying, well, you know, you shouldn't have been wearing that sign. It's your fault. You know, you brought it on yourself. The, a lot of the same kinds of accusations that happened to, to rape victims. And this was something that, th the thing is, we may not want to, we may want to go out and say that it's wrong, and I do think it's wrong. You should not do that to people. But human nature, uh, there's a satisfaction people get from it. They feel like that this person, you know, there's just a, a sense of, like, people will find these things funny. You may not want it to be. You may think it's dangerous. They will. So how do you acknowledge that, right? And how do you talk about it? That's the only thing I'm saying. I don't think, again, that it is something that is right, right? I don't think I would do it, you know, if you're saying I actually believe in that line myself. But I do find some things funny. Like when you, if you go up and, you know, you lift a mullah, even if you, even if he, he had no idea you were so doing it, I, I thought that was hilarious. Ali, the line for you is then speech that incites hate or violence, or we have heard the physical line. Yeah. I, I think, well... You, you don't condone it, but you also say you should be able to do that. No, I don't think you should be able to do that. I, I think it should be legal. I completely do. I'm just saying that we need to acknowledge that there's a reason why people find satisfaction in these things, why they laugh, and we should try to understand why they find it funny. I, when, there's another discussion about okay. milkshakes versus baseball bat. Baseball bat, I, I actually don't think it's that funny. 
milkshakes. I mean, is it more violence? Is it humiliation? Is it like a blurred line? But pies in the faces of politicians have been like this time immemorial mm. tradition of, of uh, protests in a way, illegal as it should be. But um, I don't think it's a linear slope to, if it was a linear slope to worse and worse things, it always worked that way, then we would have seen that a long time ago, but we don't. Let me ask you if you think that ridiculing ideas and religion bring society further. And well, why? Yes, in many ways and how you do it, yes, it does. And I don't, I don't regret what I, I did to the mullah either, but I think what's interesting in, is the, how the society reacts, you know? Even all comedians are, you know, uh, um, aware of that because uh, what happened after the mullah lifting uh, is that um, I told you already how the left and right wing reacts, but what the mullah did, I didn't receive a single death threat after lifting the mullah. He went to the police. That's what you do in a civilized society. You, I crossed the line, he went to the police, I never received a single death threat. So but all but he was also a refugee in Norway, so if he had done that, I think he could yes, have uh, appalled he, his but, status but as a refugee. But he is he, he's also accused of organizing terror organizations. Right. So, so the whole thing is very, very special. But um, let me just give you another example. When, uh, you know, Gaddafi uh, fall, the Gaddafi regime fall, the Norwegian press and a lot of other uh, journalists went into Gaddafi's house uh, or his uh, castle or whatever it was, they went into the, uh, you know, the private um, uh, foot, uh, um, photographies, the family photographies. And what Norwegian press did, it's that they posted a picture of Gaddafi's, uh, um, um, the, um, the wife of Gaddafi's son, naked on the bed. And they said that uh, with the, um, uh, Lines written that, uh, so this is how they uh, live it with w women, with drugs, and and you will never have done that, cross that line, if you find a private picture just because he was uh, a, a despot. You know, Norwegian press forget forgot their ethics, and they crossed the line. So I think the ethic discussion you are raising is it's very important because you, we are crossing lines all the time. So why are we doing? Because you know the the thought of starting to think that they deserve it. That's dangerous. It is. Mm. So, so I think it's it's very important that comedians also discuss that we shouldn't have, you know, it, it's our work to push the limits, and we don't have to regret it. But the discussion we should also take part in. Yeah. So, in response to your question, yeah. um, do, when we insult Islam or Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, we're not trying to make friends. Uh, we're trying to break barriers, right? We're trying to break walls. We have different strategies for different um, goals. Um, when it comes to reaching out to Muslims or religious people, we have a different tactic. But when it comes to people drawing lines for us and telling us we can't cross this line, then we're not there to make friends with people. We, we just cross the line yeah. to tell them, no, fuck you. You don't get to draw lines for us, right? And we're not trying to bring people together. That's just, and we explain that to people. And we, they on the side note, if you want to make Muslims not run away from us and still talk to us, we tell them, listen, you don't want these lines because if you draw lines for us today, you're giving authority to, to people to draw lines for you tomorrow. You went uh, um, and asked people on the streets, uh, Muslims, I think, um, um, whether they find it okay um, if Islam was uh, criticized. Why did you do that? Well, because to show that Many Muslims, if you talk to them, give them re the reasons why it's okay, you can change their opinions. And if you, in that video, I managed to convince a couple of Muslims that started with saying, no, it's not okay, within five minutes of talking, you know, like, okay, what about Christianity? Can you criticize Christianity? And they were like, no, you shouldn't also criticize Christianity. I'm like, well, Islam criticizes Christianity. And I'm like, okay, maybe you can. I'm like, okay, so Christianity, yes, but not Islam. I'm like, sure, maybe you can criticize it. So just a few minutes of talking to Muslims, it, like a lot of people think you can't change 
people's opinions. And I showed like, look, five minutes of talking, two minutes of talking. And even some of them started with like, yeah, it's okay to criticize Islam, right? Yeah. So some of them were not okay with it, but I'm sure that it's possible, but you can change people's opinions. And, and what would the role of comedy then be in criticizing uh, Islam? Oh, is that? If oh. For all of you, for you, Ali. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with everything that you said and everything that you're saying too. I think it's very, very important to do it. Uh, one of the important things about comedy, and I saw this with you know, Shabana certainly, is that you're a fantastic storyteller. So uh, to me, it's, it's not just about being funny, it's, it's about telling stories. Stories are things, that's what human beings relate to. Uh, they're very powerful, where you don't, even if you're not telling the truth, if you're packaging lies in stories, they can be compelling to people, like in religion. It's all, it's all stories, storytelling. The reason it's compelling is because it touches people emotionally. You combine that with art, and uh, it's, it's, it's essentially a lethal combination. So if we look at the, yeah. the Bible uh, or Christianity, uh, you've got art, you've got sculpture, uh, you have all of, you know, you go to the Sistine Chapel, you go to the Vatican, you see it all in, in display. You've got hymns and gospel choirs. And that really touches people emotionally. Uh, in Islam, um, we have poetry of the Quran. You know, they say music is haram, but the uh, the adhan is music. The prayer call is music. Um, the there's so uh, there's calligraphy, there's architecture, and and these are things that speak to people emotionally. And so, so how do you fill that gap as an atheist? Because uh, I think it, it creates a gap, no? I think the, that the, we the need. I, I think we need to. It, there is a gap, and this is one of the things that I, I did want to bring up today. And this is why I think what uh, Shabana is doing, what Vidu does, um, I think this is more important, and this is really the next stage and where we need to go. Because <laughs> when we have conversations like this, which is amazing, right? I, 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 I love that we're having these conversations. People do process it cerebrally, right? It's, it's, it's all above the neck. But when you when you have music, when you have satire, when you have comedy, when you have storytelling, when you have TV shows and movies, um, and I, I always give this example of the LGBT movement. I grew up in the 80s when AIDS was emerging as a social phenomenon and homophobia was rampant among liberals, conservatives, everybody. Um, we were all homophobic in school. I had to unlearn that. And all of the articles and the sort of intellectual debates that I read about were not even a tenth as powerful as watching the movie Philadelphia. Or seeing, you know, Ellen come out, Ellen DeGeneres come out. And I think that those are the things, like a fiction, uh, art, entertainment, storytelling, those are things that are incredibly important. And I, I would like to see more ex-Muslims actually get into these things. But you technically don't need to fill in that gap because I, I can enjoy Islamic and Christian and Jewish and Hindu art without believing in it, mm. right? You know, so yeah. people tell me like, oh, how could you enjoy it? You're an atheist, like, watch me. Who's I don't need your permission, I can enjoy it, right? In fact, in fact, <laughs> sure. I, te I tell people that, you know, Islam is actually a lot of fun if you don't believe in it. So, <laughs> I mean, just, just celebrate AIDS. No, it's, it's ancient mythology, it's, it has so many stories. Actually, it's very uh, nerve-wracking if you believe in it. It's, it's a book that, it's a command book with a lot of punishments in it if you believe it. Uh, but if you don't, it's just uh, like Harry Potter. You, watch, you read it, it's ancient mythology, and you enjoy it. Imagine if people actually believed in Harry Potter, if it was real, then that would be a problem. Like kids missing because they were going to try to fight Hogwarts, right? <laughs> that, that, that would and, be- And he was saying he isn't funny. Yeah, I, I was just to say- yeah, It's I not on purpose. That. But it's not, it's... <laughs> Even that was funny. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, Islam is a lot of fun. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of puzzles in how it came to be, and people haven't even touched it, you know. I'm excited about more scholarly work on Islam coming up. And can, yeah. can I add one small... Sh oh, Shabana, sorry, Shabana, yeah. Shabana. Well, the thing is also that, you know, I, I believe it's our duty as free thinkers, comedians, writers, you know, to challenge everything but suppress the freedom of thought. But, you know, w that's why I told, I didn't start it as a, uh, you know, activist. Uh, I didn't have any problem with religion when I started as a stand-up comedian, but religion had a problem with me. So I was, you know, pushed to f uh, fight back uh, for my own survival. And this is what I think a lot of people here as well experience that you are, 
you know, so much challenge just to be yourself that you are provoking uh, people, you, you, you know, who are pointing at you, you're a haram, you're a haram. So, you know, the, the, the whole idea that I have the right, you know, to threat you or push your w way of living because uh, I believe in something, the whole idea is wrong, the whole idea is, is you know, uh, stopping humanity. So we, we have to challenge it. it we, people who see that, it's our duty to do that. What, what is the alternative? Be yeah, that, that's actually my, my question. What's, what is the consequence of the absence of comedy and ridicule? What would that be? Well, well, the thing is, for some, I mean, this is why I think there shouldn't be any difference between people that are not comedians challenging ideas and comedians challenging ideas. But for some reason, people take comedy like I, I, I'm not talking about comedians. I'm I'm talking about comedy in no, general. Like, I'm just saying comedy like in general. Are. Comedy in general <laughs> is more Erickson. tolerated by people, even when it crosses some lines that people just drew for some reason, right? So the reason why we need comedy is because we need it at the front for the rest of us to follow because it's an easier way for society to accept speech that wasn't acceptable before. And it provides a sort of release also, like the permission to to laugh yeah. and to to think about it. It's, it speaks again to emotions. Uh, people are, we're, we're rational beings um, we're also emotional beings. Some of us are more one than the other. Uh, everybody has a different balance. Different things work on, on different people. Uh, and I, I like to give the example of uh, the, the American civil rights movement in this, in terms of different approaches, uh, where you know, Rosa Parks acted in silence, just refused to go to the back of the bus. Martin Luther King was more of a conciliatory politician. Uh, it was more diplomatic in the way he dealt with people. And then you had Malcolm X, who was a complete militant. And there are people who, who talk about, if we look at the civil rights movement, there are comedians, there are artists, there are TV shows. All of these things have had an impact in their own way. It's great to talk about ideas. Um, and you can talk about ideas in art forms as well, but it's also very powerful to um, take ideas and package them in a way that is emotionally appealing. That's what religion does, I know, um, and that's why it's so powerful. I think that if we do want to defeat it, we need to at least learn from that, but we have to do it with truth. And there are people who do this. There are people who take truth and they package it into amazing stories that um, really appeal to people at an emotional level, uh, like Carl Sagan, like Richard Dawkins, like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Dan Barker. Yeah, they, Dan Barker. And, and they do it uh, with scientific truth. So they do that and they make it so compelling and so awe-inspiring that you feel emotional you know, when you read their stories. So it's, it's very possible to do, and I think it's something that we really need to do more of. Um, and yet, there's a void. We can talk intellectually about ideas a lot, but if we don't acknowledge that part, uh, that's one thing that people do want. Yes. Yes, I think, I believe that it's, it's in our nature, you know, it's, it is connecting people, the comedy, it is a relief, and if, uh, you know, the, the field can make us speak more truthfully about who we are and what we are doing to each other, yeah. we should use that. Yeah, and yes. actually, Enlightenment values have a major PR problem, even though they are responsible for most of the rights that we enjoy today, most of the peace, security, safety that we enjoy today, most of the scientific um, you know, advancement, health benefits, most people don't give credit to it. And because they don't advertise in the way Ali described, right? Who, who doesn't? That's Sorry, I didn't hear that. Enlightenment values. Enlightenment right? so, values, yes. And, and, yeah, and the thing is that because enlightenment values, they, they probably didn't feel like they need to advertise it because it just works. Uh, so this is why Christianity, Islam, the far right, the far left, they come in and claim credit for the benefits and the results of ideas that have worked because in light, the people that are champions of enlightenment values, we don't really have champions of enlightenment, we just have scientists and thinkers, yeah. but we don't have the cheerleaders of enlightenment values. So because there's not much work done there, they come and take credit for it, right? Like, so what we need to do is we need to tell stories, we need, to, we need more art and poetry 
surrounding enlightenment values to introduce people to why their lives are better now compared to 100 years ago and give credit. We need to make saints out of these scientists and these you know, thinkers that are responsible for our lives today. Yeah. I, I want to acknowledge just Mariam Namazi because this conference, I've always thought for the longest time when we go to these conferences, people just do speeches and we have these Q&A sessions, but to bring in music here, to bring in stand-up comedy, uh, to have like, you know, Shelly Siegel and Shabana and Vidu and everybody um, doing these performances, this is so badly needed. This is exactly the void that we're talking about, that, that Armin's talking about here, that, that we need to fill. So Mariam, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I would like, I would like to hear you, the audience. So please, the questions, uh, my colleague will take them. There is one. Okay, I'm uh, moving in. Don't be scared. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Jamal from Norway. Welcome, Shabana, here. Uh, first of all, I, I, I have two questions, but first I have to say something to Shabana. Uh, I think mullah lifting without asking permission was perfectly okay because, uh, because, uh, because this man uh, have no respect to women and uh, he thinks uh, men have charge over women, uh, and he advocates the killing of apostates and blasphemer, blasphemers from- Two wrong doesn't make a right. That's a logical fallacy. Okay, moving on to the question. To the question, okay. thank you. Uh, uh, this man is deserving, you know, this activism. Okay, question is, uh, in your video you said, uh, uh, if I burn in Quran, it, it will give more power to Quran. I'm not agree, but uh, do you think uh, if we make caricature of Muhammad, it, if everyone making caricature in every newspaper in the West, it will give more power to pro Muhammad, or it will normalize the acceptance of blasphemy? This is one question to you, and the others also can answer. Let's start with the one. What was, it? What was the question? Yeah, the okay. question is, burning Quran mm -hmm. gives the more power to Quran, or sporting, uh, are you sporting burning of Quran? Uh, I think, can I uh, rephrase your question? Just, um, yeah, okay. Yeah. So the question I think is, um, does it, like uh, drawing cartoons, does it um, give more power um, to Islam or just does it normalize drawing cartoons and just... Um, the second one. Yeah. Right, well I mean... The second. Yeah, I mean, people uh, turn draw, uh, draw a Muhammad day into an annual event, and Muslims have learned to live with it. They, they're not reacting as intensely as they used to, right? So now, if they're now if they're sensitive about burning Quran, we need to have a burn the Quran day. Yeah, I think um, it's again about the the borders of um, the question is actually about the border of. But by the way, where, the number one. Where do we draw the line? The number one. Um, pushback I get for burning Quran was CO2 emissions. So when I burned my Quran, <laughs> I actually showed before that I donated to offset my carbon <laughs> emissions by one ton. So I all covered that. I basically, in my video, I give all, I address every single pushback against burning Quran. I address that. And the, fr the number one pushback is like, why are you introducing more CO2 to the so yeah. this is what the but jihadists can I, were can saying. I also, uh, Shirin, can I also answer Jamal because yeah. he asked me about it. Jamal, I I, uh, I agree with what has been said there that doing that a lot of time normalize it. But we know that we know that people get aggressive. We know that death threats are there. And for for me, that that particular stunt with not uh, you know threatening to not burn the Quran, uh, I did it uh, uh, just to show that they get aggressive anyhow, you know? Even if you're not burning it because you're, you are actually discussing the, the issue. That was my point on, on uh, that specific stunt. And they did, did get uh, aggressive. Islamnet, which is a fundamentalistic organization in Norway, they started to threaten me. They started to, you know, post the picture of me holding the Quran with the flame that she burned the Quran, she burned the Quran. And so, you know, the debate that she didn't, she didn't. And you know, so their, their aggression, their uh, touchiness was exposed. Yeah. So, so that mm -hmm. was the meaning of that. I think There's a question in the back from a lady, yep. I come back to you later, yeah. okay? Um, Shabana, sorry, I'm touching. <laughs> I didn't ask your permission. Uh, Shabana, um, I'm also Kurdish, so Kirkar is 
not my family, hopefully. And so um, am I. <laughs> yeah, okay, hi. hi. <laughs> um, a lot of Kurdish people actually um, have advocated for him to be uh, sent to Italy because he's not only a terrorist uh, uh, activist, let's say, or a terrorist in general, he's also a war criminal. He stoned a lot of people to death. He has um, put regimes in areas of Halabja, the place where a lot of people were gassed. But what is the question? Uh, my question is this, why is Norway not sending him to Italy, extradite him, because they have a valid extradition uh, policy? And secondly, my question is, should these people, these war criminals, have a stage at all to express their values? Yes. <laughs> Well, the first question, why is Norwegian uh, government not just sending him? They have this problem for several year, years, and I think it's, it's about the Norwegian um, recognition of human rights, because they know that he, uh, he will be s sent to death sentence but, but earlier, not maybe in Italy, but earlier. So, you know, they, they are were then protecting him. I didn't get police protection when my sister's restaurant got bullet ho holes, you know, but shoot it out. But Mullah Kreka get police pol protection when his house in Oslo was shoot it out. So there was a lot of things which is, you know, uh, have been discussed. Why is he been so much protected? But not oh. everything is public, so we, we don't know. But it is heavily debated in Norway. Yes, and we don't know all the facts right now, so I would like to go to the next question. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Omar Makram from Egypt slash Sweden. <laughs> Great to, uh, to meet you guys in person. Nice to see you again, Shabana. Likewise. Um, my question is, uh, it's more that I want to know your thoughts about, uh, about this. Like, it has been very difficult and still is to criticize Islam, but uh, I think we had made some headway, but I've been sensing a U-turn that's coming again especially with the rise of like, right-wing terror attacks and white supremacy. And I would say I, I come right now in the country that's uh, in the West most difficult to criticize Islam, Sweden. That's a very long question. Uh, yes, but wh what are your thoughts on that? Uh, would um, the accusations of, uh, of inciting violence against Muslims make it more difficult now to criticize Islam? Um, okay, okay, should I take this one? Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, sure. um, I was going to say, I think one, one of the, when you talked about not burning the Quran, what she did was, one of the things that Shabana said was that she did also did not want to give the far right what they wanted. She wanted to go against it. The thing is, Islam is a far right ideology, okay? Now we have sort of far right Western elements, and the idea that if we have left one thing and somehow uh, we need to appease the other is a problem and there it's a it's a hard trap to avoid for a lot of people because uh, a lot of ex-muslims and you know atheists they're not given platforms and the far right is offering them because it helps them a lot uh, it's an opportunistic thing so i think a lot of people are conscious about it so there is especially in this day and age you know and i i i think that that's justified now, it's a tough thing i mean we we have to decide at least, okay, I'll speak for myself, and, and I had to decide, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I lean left liberal. Uh, I want to reach my fellow liberals where I think their blind spots are, where their hypocrisies are, and I, I want to make a change, not just make a point. You know, I, I don't just want Twitter likes. I, I want to get them to think differently. So I do think about messaging um, and I do think a lot about what is the most effective way to get something like this across. And again, we said different approaches work on different people. I have my approach, uh, other people don't, and it's, so it varies. I tell Muslims that it's better to be offended than to be discriminated against. And you should, you know, we're go we, we are against Islam. We're always gonna be against Islam. We hate Islam, okay? But you should, we should be our, your favorite anti-Islam people because we also defend your rights, right? Because we will stand with you on your side when people come and challenge your rights. You should steal the platform of the anti-Islam narrative from those bigots and give it to us. We're your friendly neighborhood anti-Islam activists. We're, yeah. <laughs> 
as you would say, um, wajible cuddle. Right, and that, and, but another point I want to make is about the, the, if people are afraid of the rise of uh, the far right, but they're they're not afraid of it in the key places that are, is the far right is rising, which is, I mean, there is some rise in North America and and uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe really? actually mostly, but it's you know the main concerns is the far right in India. Um, that nobody seems to be that concerned about. The number of m Muslims that are being, uh, the number of Muslims that are influenced by the rise of far right in India is way higher than anywhere else. Nobody, in, uh, if people claim to be worried about Muslims, but they not, they don't say much about Muslims in India, Muslims in China, wow. Muslims in Yemen, Muslims in Myanmar. They just because they have this. <laughs> We, we have a whole program about that uh, tomorrow evening, by the right, way. Right, thank you. Oh, about the far right. Um, I have room for one last question. Maybe all the way in the back? I'm coming. The good looking, handsome guy in the back with the. Oh, also, you rise, know him. also rise, of, rise of the far right in Israel, by the way. Jewish far right. Uh, yeah, make, that's also a major problem that people are. This that's is a, a whole new, different program. That's a new. Let's that's stick to comedy. Anti Judaism <laughs> is another red line that we need to cross. People think we are anti Semite if we criticize Jews. Hey guys, um, so Ali, have you now changed your position on milkshakes now that Armin told you that it's, it, you're normalizing it? It's the, uh, no, it, 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 I, it's, it's I had the same, I have a lot of parallels in my position on milkshakes with Armin, uh, but I am just acknowledging the human nature part of it. I laughed when I saw Nar Nigel Farage covered in a milkshake. I thought it was funny and I don't know what to do about that. I so when it becomes, I what do when, I do? It, when it becomes a shoe, will you still laugh? When it becomes a shoe, it depends on the shoe. So if it's a soft, like... My you know, shoe. <laughs> That's, oh, just no, that that's violence. <laughs> this is just humiliation. There's and that, and actually on that note, a lot of people are like, oh, it starts with milkshake and then it goes to bricks and then some and then bullets and knives. Like, no, it doesn't have to even go there. It's already a problem. Like, it, it doesn't. You don't have to make the slippery slope uh, argument and say like it starts with this and it may get worse. That's why it's a problem. No, it's already. You throw something at somebody. It's already a problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are other people who can fight this. I mean, I'm. I'll talk about it here and there, but... I'm very sorry. We can um, talk further at the bar. Before, though, we will um, catch some balloons and uh, um, meet at the meeting point in front of the Bali to uh, do the Red Balloon March to um, the theater just here at the square. So I would like uh, to thank you very much. I would like to thank my speakers so much um, for being here. Um, and uh, yeah, have uh, have a good evening. And for those who are visiting uh, the programs tonight, have interesting, fruitful conversations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. Still have enough yeah. thank you. Thank you, Shirin. So about the protests, it's starting right now. Go to the main hall, get your balloons, and gather in front of the Bali. Thank you. Okay, okay.